Architecture, sculpture, painting, even the landscape, create a vision of a perfect place, a place of fantasy and myth where gods might walk with men. Somewhere, of course, which has never existed in history, it is imagined, yet it has been created out of fragments of the half-dreamt, half-remembered ancient Greece and Rome. The poet Shelley wrote at the beginning of the 19th century, we are all Greeks. Our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts, all have their roots in Greece. But for Greece, we might still have been savages and idolaters. The human form and the human mind attained to a perfection in Greece, which has impressed its image on those faultless productions, whose very fragments are the despair of modern art, and which can never cease to delight mankind until the extinction of the race. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Europeans surrounded themselves with the images of Greece and Rome. They created for themselves personal museums which displayed their wealth, taste and learning and idealized the virtues of reason, liberty and justice. In this way, they elevated and even masked their mundane relationships with land ownership and manufacture, trade and empire and they exported these ideals and the visual language which expressed them all over the world to the Americas, the Indies and beyond. It is appropriate then that these are the first pictures we see in a series on the tradition of Western art. We could have started in the caves of Lascaux or the temples of Luxor, but if there is a beginning, a source to which Western art and thought constantly refers, it is in ancient Greece and Rome. A Greece and Rome that are forever fantasized and idealized, but which are with us wherever we look. More than 200 years ago, when the founding fathers of the United States were building their new capital here in Washington, they searched for a visual style which would embody their democratic ideals. And they found it in Greece and Rome, in a style which for them, as still for us, embodies harmony, order and freedom. And from that day to this, the West has built its temples to liberty and justice and to money and power in the Greek and Roman style. You can see it in Trafalgar Square in London and in Leningrad in the Soviet Union, at the root of the Western tradition, in architecture, in painting and in sculpture, is the classical legacy. It's so ingrained in our way of seeing things that most of the time we don't notice when we use it in TV, in commercials, in magazines, in the coins in our pocket, even in a classical head on our credit card. And many of the uses to which we put it, no doubt, would astonish people from the ancient world. But if an ancient Greek could time travel down to our time and be here now, he would recognize this around us. He would surely feel that in some sense, the West is heir to his civilization. The power of this tradition and its hold over our imagination make it difficult for us to see the Greeks and Romans as they really were. The Athenians of the 5th century BC, the builders of the temple at Sunion, are often portrayed as superheroes, the creators of democracy and a perfect society. We must be careful, though, not to idealize them. Like all societies, theirs was imperfect. It was based on slavery. Women had no rights. They were imperialists. And in their darkest moments, as in the bitter Peloponnesian War with Sparta, the Athenians fell prey to irrationality, mass hysteria, strange religious cults, pornography, urban violence, and murderous and unjust acts of foreign policy against smaller states. Things we're all too familiar with in the modern West. But Greek artists and poets understood these things about human nature, and they made their art about those contradictions, about the tragedies and the failures, as well as the achievements. The sculptures of the altar of Zeus from Pergamon portray those contradictions in the dramatic manner of the 2nd century BC. 
that like so much Greek art, the originals have been dismembered and fragmented, scattered around the museums of the world or buried deep and forgotten. Some works are wonderfully preserved on the site of their origin, but most have been broken and bleached by time. It takes imagination and study to piece together these fragments and try to see them again in the context of the society in which they were produced. Who made these images and objects? For whom and why? What was in the artist's mind and in the patron's? And how were they seen by the surrounding society? We shall be helped in answering these questions by art historians like John Boardman of the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford. This is the way we're used to looking at Greek art in museums. In this case, in a cast gallery in the University of Cambridge, where they've assembled these rather gaunt white figures, plaster casts of the more important Greek and Roman statues, which are present in many different museums in the world. The job of the art historian and archaeologist is to try to work out what the original settings of these figures were, what was in the mind of the artist when he made them the way he did, and what the impact would have been on the society for which they were made. There are a number of examples here which make the point rather easily of the difficulty that we have in trying to make this adjustment. This little figure, for instance, which was probably made in Crete in about the middle of the 7th century BC, isn't all that unlike figures which might have been made in a number of other cultures in antiquity, in Assyria or Egypt. At least only an expert would know the difference. It's not distinctively and obviously Greek. There's another problem about it, too, which we have to adjust for. There were traces of colour on it, and in this museum, a duplicate cast has been coloured up with what they think to be more or less the colours of its original appearance, and you can see it's really quite a striking difference to the way in which we're used to seeing figures of this sort. If we move on about 100 years to another figure, and one of the important characteristics of Greek art is the extremely rapid development of style, we find something which is considerably more realistic, still very formal, rather stiff, but quite unmistakably Greek. And this figure, too, can tell us a little bit more about her original appearance because she was found with traces of color on her dress and on her face. And again, a duplicate cast here has been restored and painted up to give us an idea of what she looked like in antiquity. The colors would probably have been muted somewhat by the bright Athenian sun. But what we've got to do is to try to make these adjustments to allow for these figures in their original setting, their original appearance, try to understand their original function. Because if we can't do this, we can't understand what Greek art's really about. The art we recognize as Greek was produced in the millennium between two and three thousand years ago. The temple at Sunion was built in the great classical period of Athenian triumph, but centuries before, Greek society was already recognizably different from the other cultures of the ancient Near East. Persia and Egypt were mighty empires ruled by dynasties that gave themselves the status of gods. The Greeks lived in small city-states under the rule of petty kings. The scale of these small Greek communities, clinging to a rocky landscape, never far from the sea, made them vulnerable to attack from larger forces, but also threw them back on their resources of fitness, strength, intelligence, calculation, and above all, individual heroism. The idea of the individual standing proudly independent is one of the most powerful and resilient ideas in human history. The figure of the Kouros shows this idea taking the center of the stage. Andrew Stewart teaches at the University of California at Berkeley. It's often said that statues like this are emblematic of early Greek culture. I think they are, and I think they are for four reasons. The sculptor has taken the statue's clothes off, convinced that man is the measure of all things. He allows him to stand free and proud, allows your eyes to roam unobstructed across his body. He's autonomous. The sculptor has stripped away the back pillar and the screen between the legs of 
the Egyptian statues that were his predecessors and has allowed him to walk forward in three-dimensional space. He's beautiful. He's also youthful. The sculptor has chosen that period between 18 and 21 that the Greeks believed was the prime of one's life, the acme of one's existence on this earth. As a result, the statue could serve one of two main functions. It could be offered to the gods, particularly to Apollo, the epitome of this youthful ideal projected upon the heavens. Or it could stand above the grave of a man of any age, reminding his descendants of that time when he was in the prime of his life, standing youthful, proud, autonomous, beholden to no one, the measure of all things. The male figure, naked, proud, idealized, did have a female equivalent in the Corrie. She too is beautiful, but she is serene rather than heroic. She's clothed and static, not boldly striding forward like the male. The turn of the sixth century to the fifth century BC saw one of the most dramatic transitions in history, political and social. It coincided with an equally dramatic transition in art. The Critian boy of the early fifth century BC is the Kouros come to life. He has relaxed his body and come closer to the appearance of nature. We can only speculate about and imagine the relationship between the development of democracy in the Greek city-states and the development of an unprecedented realism in art but both, in their quite separate ways, reveal a new excitement in the idea that individual human beings can take charge of their own destiny, even though they do so under the capricious gaze of man-like gods. The Zeus, recovered from the wreck of Artemisium, shows the new freedom and confidence of sculptors modeling clay rather than carving stone, and translating the clay model by casting it in bronze. The Zeus describes his power by reaching his hand far out over his realm, brandishing his thunderbolt, gazing unwaveringly towards the horizon. He stands like an icon of divine power. It tells us that Zeus is king of the universe, that his power is infinite, that he is a supremely poised being by comparison with the hubbub and turmoil of man's life on earth. The fact that his physique is no different from that of an athlete or a hero of the same time is simply a continuation of the standard Greek notion that the gods are made in human form. That you project your own notions of male beauty 